our next speaker is Lloyd Johnson. And I would like the evaluator Hilda to read the objectives, please. To understand the purpose of stories about historical events or people. To use the storytelling skills developed in the proceeding project to tell a story about a historical event or person. And the time will be seven to nine minutes. Now, in 1995, while studying at the University of Alberta for his combined Bachelor of Education and Bachelor of Science degree, Lloyd was required to take History 397, that's the history of science. His speech today from the storytelling manual, Make History Come Alive, will be a summary of his term paper for that class. Due to the nature of his speech, the normal, you know, now normally we don't get up and leave the room while somebody's giving a speech, unless it's some, you know, emergency, uh, biological, uh, something like that. Uh, normally you don't get up and leave the room. However, the, the, that etiquette will be waived if needed. Lloyd won't be offended if anybody feels the need to step outside. So please help me welcome Lloyd Johnson with his speech, Just Another Day at the Barbershop. Just Another Day at the Barbershop. His pole with pewter basin hung, black rotten teeth in order shrugged. Range cups and in the window stood, limbed with red rags to look like blood. Did well his threefold trade explain, who shaved, drew teeth, and breathed the vein. The barber pole. In Canada and the United States, it's red, white, and blue. But in Europe, it's the more traditional pole with the red and the white. For you see, when we think of barbers these days, we think of people like Hilda. They <laughs> cut hair. They shave. They provide what was called the tonsorial services. A shave and a haircut. But that was not all. For you see, back in the medieval days, the barbers are also responsible for a medical treatment called bloodletting, to rebalance the humors in your body that were causing disease. And you may notice that their cut, bled, and the bandages look like a barber pole. And these, the barbers would hang outside to advertise their bloodletting service. But that's not all, folks. These days, you might go to the dentist to have a teeth pulled. Back then, you went to the barber. And did I mention that this was prior to the invention of anesthetic? <laughs> that doesn't look like it. And if you were in the army and you were unlucky enough to be injured by gunfire, the company barber who kept your hair trimmed to regulations would also be responsible for amputating your limbs. Um, and again, uh, no anesthetic. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to just another day at the barber shop. And I don't see Hilda advertising many of these services anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> the barbers back then were actually called the barber surgeons. And I'm going to introduce to you two of the most famous barber surgeons of history. The first one was called a Frenchman by the name of Ambrose Paré, and he is considered the father of modern surgery. He found himself at the siege of Turin after he recently completed his apprenticeship as a barber surgeon. And back then, the injured, when you were shot, medical science treated gunpowder as if it was poisonous. And the proper way to deal with a poison at that time? was with these things. Red hot boiling oil. Oh, oh, scooped out of the container and poured directly on the oh, wound. God. Oh, it oh, is no wonder that many wounded soldiers, rather than face the barber surgeon, would beg their comrades to end their suffering by slitting their throat with their bayonet. Oh. But one day, Ambrose Paré ran out of boiling oil. And this was a problem for him because poison
poisoning was not a good way to die. So he used an old Roman technique of a poultice of rose oil, egg yolk, and white, and some turpentine. He placed that on the wounds of some of these men who did not get the boiling oil treatment, and he went to bed. Little though did Monsieur Paré realize that he had just conducted a valid scientific experiment with a control group who had the conventional treatment of boiling oil. <laughs> For back then, medicine. Medicine is only for those fit enough to survive the treatment as well as the illness. So these men who did not have the boiling oil, Paré felt that they would die overnight. But when he woke and he went in to see the wounded, none of the men who received the milder treatment were dead. In fact, all of them, their wounds had gone down, they were not in pain. Whereas those who had received the conventional boiling oil treatment, as expected, many of them had died during the night, and their wounds were inflamed. There's nothing like a good third or second degree burn to really start the healing process. And it was at that point that Mr. Paré said, I will never subject any of my patients to the boiling oil treatment again. His patients survived because he had the courage to go against standard medical treatment. The next one happened about a hundred years later, just when you think it couldn't be worse. And I'm going to introduce you to two men. The first one is King Louis XIV of France, the Sun King, one of the best kings that France has ever had, apparently. And Charles Francois Félix. And yes, an anal fissure sounds painful. For those of you who do not know, it is an extra hole, exactly where I said it is. <laughs> now Louis XIV, as it came down to hygiene, even by the standards of the day, was not very hygienic. He did not believe in baths. He only had two during his entire life. And when it came to what we would call toilet hygiene, even by the standards of those days, he was lacking. He was the kind of man that you smelt him coming long before you saw him. And this fissure was causing him a lot of pain. The conventional treatment was noticed by the physicians as they gave him his daily enemas. Now I did consider showing you a picture of what an, an anal fissure looks like, but I decided I didn't want to look at that. And I'm pretty sure none of you wanted to either. But they applied treatments like lye, you remember those red hot pokers that they used for treating gunshot wounds? Well, they used those too. And it just wasn't working. So finally, Monsieur Felix was summoned to the king and told that he would have to perform surgery to fix this. He wisely asked for six months to prepare. During those six months, he had full range of the royal prison. How many of you would have wanted to be a prisoner back then with Monsieur Felix coming and he would experiment on these prisoners, all of whom were in good health before he started with them? I cannot say that that was the same for anybody afterwards. And he developed the two tools that he would need to operate on the king. The first one was this retractor. And I don't care how much practice you have, I don't want it. <laughs> nope. The other one was the royally curved scalpel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we all remember where the surgery was going to be performed. Mm -hmm. And both of these tools, by the way, are in display at the Versailles in France. The surgery was successful. The king was bandaged up on his derriere, and within six weeks he was able to ride his horse again. And just to let you know that celebrity worship is nothing new, many of the court followers of the king began to bandage their own bottoms up.
And some of the more enterprising ones even offered Monsieur Felix a lot of money to perform the same surgery on them. For you see, anal fissures were quite fashionable in France at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur Felix, however, never operated again. He accepted grants of land, money, and a title, becoming Charles Francois Felix de Tassé, a nobleman. But he never wanted to operate again. He got lucky once. So next time you're complaining about the health care in Canada, just think about the next time you're going to have surgery. It won't be like this. In a chair, strapped, while the surgeon cut into your flesh with a saw. While the previous client in that chair simply had this. Adam Toastmaster.